Chapter 6, The Festivities. This is one of those chapters again where Professor Bongiorno of Colombia, the Florinese guru, claims that the Morgenstern's satiric genius is at its fullest flower. That's the way this guy talks. Fullest flower, delicious drolleries, and on and on. This festivities chapter is mostly detailed descriptions of, guess what? Bingo! The festivities. It's like 89 days till the nuptials. And nuptials, nuptials, nuptials. Let's get the word right, shall we? Nuptials. And every high muckamuck in Florin has to give a do for the couple. And Morgenstern fills his pages, uh, and what Morgenstern fills his pages with is how the various Richies of the time entertained. What kind of parties, what kind of food, who did the decorations, how did the seating arrangements get settled, all that kind of thing. The only interesting part, but it's not worth going through 44 pages for, is that Prince Humperdinck gets more and more interested and mannerly towards Buttercup, hmm. cutting down even a little on his hunting activities. And more important, because of the foiling of the kidnapping attempt, three things happen. Number one, everyone is pretty well convinced that the plot was engineered by Gilder. So, relations between the countries are more than a little strained. Number two, Buttercup is just adored by everybody because the rumors are all over that she acted very brave and even came through the fire swamp alive, which she did. And numero three, Prince Humperdinck is, at last, in his own land, a hero. He was never popular, what with his hunting fetish and leaving the country to kind of rot once his old man got senile. But the way he foiled the kidnapping made everybody realize that this was some brave fella, and they were lucky to have him next in line to lead them. Anyhow, these 44 pages cover just about the first month of the party giving. And it's not till the end of that that, for my money, things get going again. Buttercup is in bed, pooped. It's late, the end of another long party. And as she waits for sleep, she wonders what sea Wesley is riding on. And the giant and the Spaniard, whatever happened to them? So eventually, in three quick flashbacks, Morgan Morgenstern returns to what I think is the story. And we will now return to the story. When Inigo regained consciousness, it was still night on the cliffs of insanity. Far below, the waters of Florin Channel pounded. Inigo stirred, blinked, tried to rub his eyes, couldn't. His arms were tied together around a tree. Inigo blinked again, banishing cobwebs. He had gone on his knees to the man in black, ready for death. Clearly, the victor had other notions. Inigo looked around as best he could, and there it was, the six-fingered sword glittering in the moonlight like lost magic. Inigo stretched his right leg as far as it would go and managed to touch the handle. Then it was simply a matter of inching the weapon close enough <coughs> to be graspable by one hand. And then it was an even simpler task to slash his bindings. He was dizzy when he stood, and he rubbed his head behind his ear where the man in black had struck him. A lump, sizable to be sure, but not a major problem. The major problem was what to do now. Vizzini had strict instructions for occasions such as this. When a plan went wrong, go back to the beginning. Back to the beginning and wait for Vizzini, then regroup, replan, start again. Inigo had even made a little rhyme out of it for Fezzik, so that the giant would not have problems remembering what to do in times of trouble. Fool, fool, back to the beginning is the rule. Inigo knew precisely where the beginning was. They had gotten the job in Florence City itself, the thieves' quarter. Vizzini had made the arrangements alone, as he always did. He had met with their employer, had accepted the job, had planned it, all in the thieves' quarter. 
So the thieves' quarter was clearly the place to go. Only Inigo hated it there. <clears throat> Everybody was so dangerous, big, mean, and muscular. And so what if he was the greatest fencer in the world? Who'd know it to look at him? He looked like a skinny Spanish guy. It might be fun to rob. You couldn't walk around with a sign saying, be careful, this is the greatest fencer since the death of the wizard Corsica of Corsica. Do not burgle. Mm -mm. Besides, and here Inigo felt deep pain, he wasn't that great of a fencer. Not anymore. He couldn't be. Hadn't he just been beaten? Once, true, he had been a titan. But now, now, hmm. And now a word from our author. What happens here that you aren't going to read is the six-page soliloquy from Inigo in which Morgenstern, through Inigo, reflects on the anguish of fleeting glory. The reason for the soliloquy here is that Morgenstern's previous book had gotten bombed by the critics and also hadn't sold beans. Aside, did you know that Robert Browning's first book of poems didn't sell one copy? It's true. Even his mother didn't buy it at her local bookstore. Have you ever heard anything more humiliating? How would you like to have been Browning, and it's your first book, and you have these secret hopes that now you'll be somebody, established, important, and you give it a week before you ask the publisher how things are going, because you don't want to seem pushy or anything, and then maybe you drop by, and it was probably all very English and understated in those days, and you're Browning, and you chit-chat around a bit before you drop the biggie. Oh, by the way, any notions yet on how my poems might be doing? And then his editor, who's been dreading this moment, probably says, Well, you know how it is with poetry these days. Nothing's taking off like it used to. It requires a bit of time for the word to get around. And then finally, somebody had to say it. None, Bob. Sorry, Bob. No, we haven't yet had one authenticated sale. We thought for a bit that Hatchards had a potential buyer down by Piccadilly, but it didn't quite work out. Sorry, Bob. Of course, we'll keep you posted in the event of a breakthrough. End of aside. Anyway, Inigo finishes his speech to the cliffs and spends the next few hours finding a fisherman who sails him back to Florin City. The thieves' quarter was worse than he remembered. Always before, Fezzik had been with him, and they made rhymes, and Fezzik was enough to keep any thief away. Inigo moved panicked up the dark streets, desperately afraid. Why this giant fear? What was he afraid of? He sat on a filthy stoop and pondered. Around him there were cries in the night from the alehouses, vulgar laughter. He was afraid. He realized then because, as he sat there gripping the six-fingered sword for confidence, he was suddenly back to what he had been before Vizzini had found him, a failure. A man without point, with no attachment to tomorrow, Inigo had not touched brandy in years. Now he felt his fingers fumbling for money. Now he heard his footsteps running towards the nearest alehouse. Now he saw his money on the counter. Now he felt the brandy bottle in his hand. Back to the stoop he ran. He opened the bottle. He smelled the rough brandy. He took a sip. He coughed. He took a swallow. He coughed again. He gulped it down, and he coughed, and he gulped some more, and and half began a smile. His fears were starting to leave him. After all, why should he have been afraid? He was Inigo Montoya. The bottle was half gone now. Son of the great Domingo Montoya. So what was there in the world worth fearing? Now all the brandy was gone. How dare fear, how dare fear approach a wizard such as Inigo Montoya? Well, never again into the second bottle. Never, 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 never again. He sat alone and confident and strong. His life was straight and fine. He had money enough for brandy, and if you had that, you had the world. The stoop was wretched and bleak. Inigo slumped there, quite contented, clutching the bottle in his once trembling hands. Existence was really very simple when you did what you were told. And nothing could be simpler or better than what he had in store. All he had to do was wait and drink until Vizzini came. Fezzik had no idea how long he was unconscious. 
He only knew, as he staggered to his feet on the mountain path, that his throat was very sore. Where did the man in black... Uh, whoa, where the man in black had strangled him. Yeah. What to do? The plans had all gone wrong. Fezzik closed his eyes, trying to think. There was a proper place to go when plans went wrong, but he couldn't quite remember it. And Ego had even made a rhyme up for him so he wouldn't forget, and now even with that, he was so stupid that he had forgotten. Was that it? Oh, was it stupid, stupid, go and wait for Vizzini with Cupid? Mm, that rhymed, but where was Cupid? Dummy, dummy, go out now and fill your tummy. That rhymed too, but what kind of instructions were those? Ugh, what to do? Dunce, dunce, use your brain and do it right for once. No help. Nothing was any help. He never had done anything right, not in his whole life, until Vizzini came. And without another thought, Fezzik ran off into the night after the Sicilian. Vizzini was napping when he got there. He had been drinking wine and dozed off. Fezzik dropped to his knees and put his hands in prayer position. Vizzini, I'm sorry, he began. Vizzini napped on. Fezzik shook him gently. Vizzini did not wake. Not so gently this time. Nothing. Oh, I see, you're dead, Fezzik said. He stood up. He's dead, Vizzini is, he said softly. And then, with not a bit of help from his brain, a great scream of panic burst from his throat into the night. Inigo! And he whirled back down the mountain path. Because if Inigo was alive, it would be all right. It wouldn't be the same. No, it could never be that without Vizzini to order them and insult them, as only he could. But at least there would be time for poetry. And when Fezzik reached the cliffs of insanity, he said, Inigo, Inigo, here I am, to the rocks, and I'm here, Inigo, it's your Fezzik, to the trees, and Inigo, Inigo, answer me, please, all over, until there was no other conclusion to draw, but that, just as there was now no Vizzini, so there was also no Inigo, and that was hard. It was, in point of fact, too hard for Fezzik. So he began to run, crying out, Be with you in a minute, Inigo! And right behind you, Inigo! And, Hey, Inigo, wait up! Wait up, straight up. Which was the way he ran. And wouldn't there be fun with rhymes once he and Inigo were, close together, were together again? But after an hour or so of shouting, his throat gave out because he had, after all, been strangled almost to death in the very recent past. On he ran, on and on and on, until finally he reached a tiny village and found, just outside town, some nice rocks that formed kind of a cave, almost big enough for him to stretch out in. He sat with his back against a rock and his hands around his knees and his throat hurting until the village boys found him. They held their breath and crept as close as they dared. Fezzik hoped they would go away, so he froze, pretending to be off with Inigo, and Inigo would say, Beryl, and Fezzik, right quick, would come back and say, Carol, and maybe they would sing a little something until Inigo said, Serenade, and you couldn't stump Fezzik with one that easy because of centigrade, and then Inigo would make a word about the weather, and Fezzik would rhyme it, and that was how it went until the village boy stopped being afraid of him. Fezzik, Fezzik could tell, tell that because they were creeping very close to him now and all of a sudden yelling their lungs out and making crazy faces. He didn't really blame them. He looked like the kind of person you did that to, mocked. His clothes were torn, his throat was gone, and his eyes were wild, and he probably would have yelled too if he had been their age. It was only when they found him funny that he found it, though he did not know the word, degrading. No more yelling. Just laughter now. Laughter, Fezzik thought. And then he thought, Giraffeter. Because that's all he was to them, some huge funny thing that couldn't make much noise. Laughter, Giraffeter. From now to hereafter. Fezzik huddled up in his cave and tried looking on the bright side. At least they weren't throwing things at him. 
Well, not yet anyway. Wesley awoke chained in a giant cage. His shoulder was beginning to fester from the gnawing and digging that the ROUS had done into his flesh. He ignored his discomfort momentarily to try and adjust to his surroundings. He was certainly underground. It was not the lack of windows that made that sure, more the dankness. From somewhere above him now, he could hear animal sounds. An occasional lion roar, the yelp of the cheetah. Shortly after his return to consciousness, the albino appeared, bloodless with skin as pale as dying birch. The candlelight that served to illuminate the cage made the albino seem totally like a creature who had never seen the sun. The albino held a tray which carried many things, bandages and food, healing powders, and brandy. Where are we? From Wesley. A shrug from the albino. Who are you? Shrug. That was almost the entire extent of the fellow's conversation. Wesley asked a question after question while the albino tended and redressed his wound, then fed him food that was warm and surprisingly good and plentiful. Shrug. Shrug. Who knows I'm here? Shrug. Lie, but tell me something. Give an answer. Who knows I'm here? Whispered. I know. They know. They? Shrug. The prince and the count, you mean? Hmm. And that's all? Hmm. When I was brought in, I was half conscious. The count was giving the orders, but three soldiers were carrying me. They know, too. Mm-mm. New. They're dead, that's what you're saying? Mm. Am I to die, then? Mm. Wesley lay back on the floor of the giant underground cage, watching as the albino silently reloaded the tray, glided from sight. If the soldiers were dead, surely it was not unreasonable to assume that he would eventually follow. But if they wanted his erasure, surely it was also not unreasonable to assume that they had not the least intention of doing it immediately. Else why tend to his wounds? Why return his strength with good, warm food? Now, his death would be a while yet. But in the meantime, considering the personalities of his captors, it was finally not unreasonable to assume that they would do their best to make him suffer greatly. Wesley closed his eyes. There was pain coming, and he had to be ready for it. He had to prepare his brain. He had to get his mind controlled and safe from their efforts so that they could not break him. He would not let them break him. He would hold together against anything and all. If only they gave him sufficient time to make ready. He knew he could defeat pain. That's not a yawn, by the way. It turned out they gave him sufficient time. It was months before the machine was ready. But they broke him anyway. At the end of the 30th day of festivities, with 60 days more of partying to enjoy, Buttercup was genuinely concerned that she might lack the strength to endure. Smile, smile, hold hands, bow, thank. Over and over. She was simply exhausted from one month. How was she to survive twice that? turned out, because of the king's health, to be both easy and sad, for within 55 days to go, with 55 days to go, Lotharan began to weaken terribly. Prince Humperdinck ordered new doctors brought in. There was still the last miracle man alive, Max, but since they had fired him long before, bringing him back on the case now was simply not deemed wise. If he was incompetent then... When Lothar, that was not Eon, when Lotharan was only desperately ill, how could he suddenly be a cure-all now with Lotharan actually dying? The new doctors all agreed on various tried-and-true medications, and within 48 hours of their coming on the case, the king was dead. Hmm. The wedding date, of course, was unchanged. It wasn't every day a country had a 500th anniversary, but all the festivities were either curtailed entirely or vastly cut down, and Prince Humperdinck became, 45 days before the wedding, King of Florin. And that changed everything, because before he had taken nothing but his hunting seriously, and now he had to learn 
learned everything, learned to run a country. And he buried himself in books and wise men. And how did you tax this? And when should you tax that? And foreign entanglements and who could be trusted and how far and with what? And before her lovely eyes, Humperdinck changed from a man of fear and action to one of frenzied wisdom because he had to get it all straight now before any other country dared interfere with the future of Florin. So the wedding, when it actually took place, was a tiny thing and brief, sandwiched in between ministers' meetings and a treasury crisis. And Buttercup spent her first afternoon as queen, wandering around the castle, not knowing what in the world to do with herself. It wasn't until King Humperdinck walked out on the balcony with her to greet the gigantic throng that had spent the day in patient waiting that she realized it had happened. She was the queen. Her life, for whatever it was worth, belonged now to the people. They stood together on the castle balcony, accepting the cheers, the cries, the endless thunderous hip-hips, until Buttercup said, Please, may I walk once more among them? And the king said, with a nod, that she might, and down she went again, as on the day of the wedding announcement, radiant and alone, and again the people swept apart to let her pass, weeping and cheering and bowing, and... And then one person booed. On the balcony, watching it all, Humperdinck reacted, and instantly, gesturing soldiers into the area where the sound had come from, dispatching more troops quickly down to surround the queen. And like clockwork... Buttercup was safe, the boomer apprehended, and led away. Hold a moment, Buttercup said, still shaken by the unexpectedness of what had happened. The soldier who held the boor stopped. Bring her to me, Buttercup said, and in a moment the boor was right there, eye to eye. It was an ancient woman, withered and bent, and Buttercup thought of all the faces that had gone by in her lifetime, but this one she could not remember. Have we met? the queen asked. The old one shook her head. Then why? Why on this day? Why do you insult the queen? Because you are not worthy of cheers, the old woman said. And suddenly she was yelling, You had love in your hands, and you gave it up for gold. She turned to the crowd. It is true what I tell you. There was love alongside her in the fire swamp, and she dropped it from her fingers like garbage. And that's what she is. She's the queen of garbage. I had given my word to the prince, Buttercup began, but the old woman would not be quieted. Ask her how she got through the fire swamp. Ask her if she did it alone. She threw love away to be the queen of grime, the queen of muck. I am old and life means nothing to me, so I am the only person in all this crowd to dare to tell the truth. And the truth says... Bow to the queen of fetulence if you want to, but not I. Cheer the queen of slime and ordure if you want to, but not I. Rave over the beauty of the queen of cesspools, but not I. Not I. She was advancing on Buttercup now. Take her away, Buttercup ordered. But the soldiers could not stop her, and the old woman kept coming on her voice getting louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. Buttercup woke up screaming. She was in her bed, alone, safe. The wedding was still 60 days away, but her nightmares had begun. The next night, she dreamed of giving birth to their first child and... Interruption. And hey, how about giving old Morgenstern credit for a major league fake out there? I mean, didn't you think for a while, at least, that they were really married? I did. It's one of my biggest memories of my father reading. I had pneumonia, remember? But I was a little better now, and madly caught up in the book, and one thing you know when you're ten is that no matter what, there's going to be a happy ending. They can sweat all they want to scare you, the authors, but back of it all, you know, you just have no doubt that in the long run, justice is going to win out, and Wesley and Buttercup, well... They had their troubles, sure, but they were going to get married and live happily ever after. I would have bet the family fortune if I'd found a sucker big enough to take me on. Well, when my father got through with that sentence, where the wedding was sandwiched between the minister's meetings and the treasury, whatever, I said, you're reading that wrong. 
my father's this little bald barber. Remember that too. Any kind of illiterate, right? Well, you just don't challenge a guy who has trouble reading and say he's reading something incorrectly because that's really threatening. I'm doing the reading, he said. I know that, but you get it wrong. She didn't marry that rotten humperdink. She marries Wesley. It says right here, my father began, a little huffy, and he starts going over it again. You must have skipped a page then. Something. Get it right, huh? By now, he was more than a teeny bit upset. I skipped nothing. I read the words. The words are there. I read them. Good night. And off he went. Hey, please, no, I called after him. But he's stubborn, and next thing my mother was in saying, Your father says his throat is too sore. I told him not to read so much. And she tucked and fluffed me in, uh, fluffed me in, no matter how I battled. It was over. No more story till the next day. I spent that whole night thinking Buttercup married Humperdinck. It just rocked me. How can I explain it? But the world didn't work that way. Good got attracted to good. Evil, you flushed down the john, and that was that. But their marriages? I couldn't make a jibe. First, I thought that probably Buttercup had this fantastic effect on Humperdinck and turned him into a kind of Wesley, or maybe Wesley and Humperdinck turned out to be long-lost brothers, and Humperdinck was so happy to get his brother back, and he said, Look, Wesley, I didn't realize who you were, and when I married her, so what I'll do is this. I'll divorce her, and you marry her, and that way we'll all be happy to this day. I don't think I was ever more creative. But it didn't take. Something was wrong, and I couldn't lose it. Suddenly there was this discontent gnawing away until it had a place big enough to settle in, and then it curled up and stayed there, and it's still inside me, lurking as I write this now. <sighs> the next night, when my father went back to reading, and the marriage turned out to have been Buttercup's dream, I screamed, I knew it! All along, I knew it! And my father said, so you're happy now? It's all right now? We can please continue? And I said, go. And he did. But I wasn't happy. Oh, my ears were happy. I guess. My story sense was happy, my heart too. But in my, I suppose you have to call it, soul, there was that darn discontent shaking its dark head. All this was never explained to me till I was in my teens, and there was this great woman who lived in my hometown, Edith Nesser. Dead now, but she wrote terrific books about how we screw up our children. Brothers and Sisters was one of her books, and The Eldest Child was another published by Harper. Edith doesn't need the plug, seeing as, like I said, she's no longer with us. But if there are any amongst you who are worried that maybe you're, you're not being perfect parents, pick up one of Edith's books while there's still time. I knew her because her kid Ed got his haircuts from my pop, and she was this writer. And by my teens, I knew secretly that this was the life for me too, except I couldn't tell anybody. It was too embarrassing. Barbara's sons, if they hustled, Maybe got to be IBM salesman, but writers? No way. Don't ask me how, but eventually Edith discovered my shh ambition. And from then on, sometimes we would talk. And I remember once we were having iced tea on the Nesser porch and talking, and just outside the porch was their badminton court, and I was watching some, some kids playing badminton, and Ed had just shellacked me. And as I left the court for the porch, he said, Don't worry, it'll all work out. You'll get me next time. And I nodded, and then Ed said, and if you don't, you'll beat me at something else. I went to the porch and sipped iced tea, and Edith was reading this book, and she didn't put it down when she said, that's not necessarily true, you know. I said, how do you mean? And that's when she put her book down and looked at me and said it. Life isn't fair, Bill. We tell our children that it is, but it's a terrible thing to do. It's not only a lie, it's a cruel lie. Life is not fair, and it never has been, and it is never going to be. Would you believe that for me right now? It was like one of those comic books where the light bulb goes on over Mandrake the Magician's head. It isn't, I said. So loud it really startled her. You're right. It's not fair. I was so happy. If I had known how to dance, I'd have started dancing. Isn't that great? Isn't it just terrific? I think along about here, Edith must have thought I was well on my way towards being bunkers. But it meant so much to me to have it said and out and free and flying. That was the discontent I endured the night my father stopped reading. I realized then that was the reconciliation I was trying to make and couldn't. That's what I think this book is about. 
All of those Columbia experts can spiel all they want about the delicious satire. They're crazy. This book says, life isn't fair, and I'm telling you, one and all, you better believe it. I got a fat, spoil, spoiled son, and he's not going to nab Miss Rein Reingold, and he's always going to be fat, and even if he gets skinny, he'll still be fat, and he'll still be spoiled, and life will never be enough to make him happy, and that's my fault, maybe. Make it all my fault if you want. The point is, we're not created equal for the rich. They sing, life isn't fair. I got a cold wife. She's brilliant. She's stimulating. She's terrific. There's no love. That's okay, too. Just so long as we don't keep expecting everything to somehow even out for us before we die. Look. Grown-ups, skip this paragraph. I'm not about to tell you this book has a tragic ending. I already said in the very first line how it was my favorite in all the world, but there's a lot of bad stuff coming up. Torture, you've already been prepared for, but there's worse. There's death coming up, and you better understand this. Some of the wrong people die. Be ready for it. This isn't Curious George uses the potty. Nobody warned me, and it was my own fault. You'll see what I mean in a little. And that was my mistake, so I'm not letting it happen to you. The wrong people die. Some of them, and the reason is this, Life is not fair. Forget all the garbage your parents put out. Remember Morganster and you'll be a lot happier. Okay, enough. Back to the next. Nightmare time. The next night, she dreamed of giving birth to their first child, and it was a girl, a beautiful little girl. And Buttercup said, I'm sorry it wasn't a boy. I knew you needed an heir. And Humperdinck said, Beloved sweet, don't concern yourself with that. Just look at the glorious child God has given us. And then he left Buttercup and held the child to her perfect breast. And the child said, your milk is sour. And Buttercup said, oh, I'm sorry. And she shifted to the other breast. And the child said, no, this is sour too. And Buttercup said, I don't know what to do. And the baby said, you always know what to do. You always know exactly what to do. You always do exactly what's right for you. And the rest of the world can go hang. And Buttercup said, you mean Wesley? And the baby said, of course I mean Wesley. And Buttercup explained patiently, I thought he was dead, you see. I'd given my word to your father. And the baby said, I'm dying now. There's no love in your milk, and your milk has killed me. And then the child stiffened and cracked and turned into Buttercup's hands, turned in Buttercup's hands to nothing but dry dust, and Buttercup screamed and screamed, even when she was awake again within 59 days to go till her marriage. She was still screaming. The third nightmare came quickly the following evening, and it was a baby this time, a son, a marvelous strong boy, and Humperdinck said, Beloved, it's a boy, and Buttercup said, I didn't fail you, thank heavens. And then he was gone, and Buttercup called out, May I see my son now? And all the doctors scurried around outside her royal room, royal room, but the boy was not brought in. What seems to be the trouble? Buttercup called out, and the chief doctor said, I don't quite understand, but he doesn't want to see you. And Buttercup said, Tell him I am his mother, and I am the queen, and I command his presence. And then he was there, just as handsome a baby boy as anyone could wish for. Close it, Buttercup said, and the doctors closed the door. The baby stood in the corner as far from her bed as he could. Come here, darling, Buttercup said. Why? Oh, why? Are you going to kill me too? I'm your mother, and I love you. Now come here. I've never killed anybody. You killed Wesley. Did you see his face in the fire swamp when you walked away and left him? That's what I call killing. When you're older, you'll understand things. Now, I'm not going to tell you again. Come here. Murderer! The baby shouted, Murderer! But by then she was out of bed and she had him in her arms and was saying, Stop that. Stop it this instant. I love you. And he said, Your love is poison. It kills. And he died in her arms. And she started to cry. Even when she was awake again, with 58 days to go till her marriage, she was still crying. The next night, she simply refused to go to sleep. Instead, she walked and read and did needlework and drank cup after cup of steaming tea from the Indies. She felt sick with weariness, of course, but such was her fear of what she might dream that she preferred any waking discomfort to whatever sleep might have to offer. And at dawn, her mother was pregnant, no more than pregnant. Her mother was having a baby, and as Buttercup stood there in the corner of the room, she watched herself being born, and her father gasped at her beauty, and so did her mother, and the midwife was the first to show concern. The midwife was a sweet woman, known throughout the village for her love of babies, and she said, look, trouble. And father said, what trouble? Where before did you ever see such beauty? And the midwife said, don't you understand why she was given such beauty? It's because she has no heart. Here, listen. The baby is alive, but there is no beat. 
and she held Buttercup's chest against the father's ear, and the father could only nod and say, we must find a miracle man to place a heart inside. But the midwife said, that would be wrong, I think. I've heard before of creatures like this, the heartless ones, and as they grow bigger, they get more and more beautiful, and behind them is nothing but broken bodies and shattered souls. And these, without hearts, are anguish bringers. And my advice would be, since you're both still young, to have another child, a different child, and be rid of this one now. But of course, the final decision is up to you. And the father said to the mother, Well? And the mother said, Since the midwife is the kindest person in the village, she must know a monster when she sees one. Let's get to it. So Buttercup's father and Buttercup's mother put their hand, hands to the baby's throat, and the baby began to gasp. Even when Buttercup was awake again at dawn, with 57 days to go till her marriage, she could not stop gasping. From then, then on, the nightmares became simply too frightening. When there were 50 days to go, Buttercup knocked one night on the door to Prince Humperdinck's chambers. She entered when he bid her to. I see trouble, he said. You look very ill. And so she did. Beautiful, of course, still that, but in no way well. Buttercup did not see quite how to begin. He ushered her into a chair. He got her water. She sipped at it, staring dead ahead. He put the glass to one side. At your convenience, princess, he said. It comes to this, Buttercup began. In the fire swamp, I made the worst mistake in all the world. I love Wesley. I always have. It seems I always will. I did not know this when you came to me. Please believe what I'm about to say. When you said that I must marry you or face death, I answered, kill me. I meant that, and I mean this now too. If you say I must marry you in 50 days, I will be dead by morning. The prince was literally stunned. After a long moment, he knelt by Buttercup's chair and, in his gentlest voice, started to speak. I admit that when we first became engaged, there was to be no love involved. That was as much my choice as yours, though the notion may have come from you. But surely you must have noticed in this last month of parties and festivities, a certain warming of my attitude. I have, you have been both sweet and noble. Thank you. Having said that, I hope you appreciate how difficult this next sentence is for me to say. I would die myself rather than cause you unhappiness by standing in the way of your marrying the man you love. Buttercup wanted almost to weep with gratitude. She said, I will bless you all my days for your kindness. Then she stood so it's settled. Our wedding is off. He stood too, except for perhaps one thing. That being, have you considered the possibility that he might not now want any longer to marry you? Until that moment, she had not. You were, I hate to remind you, not altogether gentle with his emotions in the fire swamp. Forgive me for saying that, beloved, but you did leave him in the lurch, in a manner of speaking. Buttercup sat down hard, her turn now to be stunned. Humperdinck knelt again beside her. This Wesley of yours, this sailor boy, he has pride? Buttercup managed to whisper, more than any man alive, I sometimes think. Well, consider then, dearest, here he is, off sailing somewhere with the dread pirate Roberts. He has had a month to survive the emotional scars you dealt him. What if he wants now to remain single? Or worse, what if he has found another? Buttercup was now even beyond whispering. I think, sweetest child, that we should strike a bargain, you and I. If Wesley wants to marry you still, bless you both. If, for reasons unpleasant to mention, his pride will not let him, then you will marry me, as planned, and be queen of Florin. He couldn't be married, I'm sure, not my Wesley. She looked at the prince. But how can I find out? What about this? You write him a letter, telling him everything. We'll make four copies. I'll take my four fastest ships and order them off in all directions. The Dread Pirate Roberts is not often more than a month's sail from Florin. Whichever of my ships finds him will run the white flag of truce. Deliver your letter, and Wesley can decide if, no, he can speak that message to my captain if, yes, my captain will sail him here to you, and I will have to content myself somehow with a lesser bride. I think, 
I'm not sure, but I definitely think that this is the most generous decision I have yet heard. Do me this favor then in return. Until we know Wesley's intentions, one way or another, let us continue as we have, so the festivities will not be halted. And if I seem too fond of you, remember that I cannot help myself. Agreed, Buttercup said, going to the door, but not before she kissed his cheek. He followed her. Off with you now and write your letter. And he returned the kiss, smiling with his eyes at her until the corridor curved her from his sight. There was no doubt whatsoever in his mind that he was going to seem too fond of her in the days ahead. Because when she died of murder on their wedding night, it was crucial that all Florin realized the depths of his love, the epical size of his loss. Since then, no one would dare hesitate to follow him in the revenge war he was to launch against Gilder. At first, when he hired the Sicilian, he was convinced it was best that someone else do her in, all the while making it appear the work of soldiers from Gilder. And when the man in black had somehow materialized to spoil his plans, the prince came close to going insane with rage. But now his basically optimistic nature had reasserted itself. Everything always worked out for the best. The people were infatuated with Buttercup now, as they had never been before her kin kidnapping. And when he announced from his castle balcony that she had been murdered, he already saw the scene in his mind. He would arrive just too late to save her from strangling, but soon enough to see the Gildarian soldiers leaping from the window of his bedroom to the soft ground below. When he made that speech to the masses on the 500th anniversary of, the, of his country, well, there wouldn't be a dry eye in the square. And although he was just the least bit perturbed, since he had never actually killed a woman before with his bare hands, there was a first time for everything. Besides, if you wanted something done right, you did it yourself. That night, they began to torture Wesley. Count Rugen did the actual pain-inducing. The prince simply, simply sat by, asking questions out loud, inwardly admiring the count's skill. The count really cared about pain. The whys behind the screams interested him fully as much as the anguish itself. And whereas the prince spent his life in physically following the hunt, Count Rugen read and studied anything he could get his hands on dealing with the subject of distress. All right now, the prince said to Wesley, who lay in the great fifth-level cage. Before we begin, I want you to answer me this. Have you any complaints about your treatment thus far? None whatever, Wesley replied, and in truth he had none. Oh, he might have preferred to be unchained a bit now and then, but if you were to be a captive, you couldn't ask for more than he had been given. The albino's medical ministrations had been precise, and his shoulder was fine again. The food the albino brought had always been hot and nourishing, the wine and brandy wonderfully warming against the dankness of the underground cage. You feel fit then, the prince went on. I assume my legs are a little stiff from being chained, but other than that, yes. Good. Then I promise you this, as God himself is my witness, answer the next question and I will set you free this night. But you must answer it honestly, fully, withholding nothing. If you lie, I will know, and then I'll loose the count on you. I have nothing to hide, Wesley said. Ask away. Who hired you to kidnap the princess? It was someone from Gilder. We found fabric indicating as much on the princess's horse. Tell me that man's name, and you are free. Speak. No one hired me, Wesley said. I was working strictly freelance, and I didn't kidnap her. I saved her from others who were doing that very thing. You seem a reasonable fellow, and my princess claims to have known you for many years. So I will give you, on her account, one last and final chance, the name of the man in Gilder who hired you. Tell me, or face tortured. No one hired me, I swear. The Count set fire to Wesley's hands. Nothing permanent or disabling, he just dipped Wesley's hands in oil and brought a candle close enough to set things bubbling. When Wesley had screamed, No one, no one, no one, on my life! A sufficient number of times, the Count dipped Wesley's hands in water, and he and the prince left via the underground entrance, leaving the medication to the albino who was always nearby during the torturing times, but never visible enough to be distracting. I feel quite invigorated, the count said, as he and the prince began to ascend the underground staircase. It's a perfect question. He was telling the truth. Clearly, we both know that. The prince nodded. 
The Count was privy to all his innermost plans for the revenge war. I'm fascinated to see what happens, the Count went on. Which pain will be the least endur endurable, the physical or the mental anguish of having freedom offered if the truth is told, then telling it and being thought a liar? I think the physical, said the Prince. I think you're wrong, said the Count. Actually, they were both wrong. Wesley suffered not at all throughout. His screaming was totally a performance to please them. He had been practicing his defenses for a month now, and he was more than ready. The minute the Count brought the candle close, Wesley raised his eyes to the ceiling, dropped his eyelids over them, and in a state of deep and steady concentration, he took his brain away. Buttercup was what he thought of. Her autumn hair, her perfect skin, and he brought her very close beside him and had her whisper in his ear throughout the burning, I love you, I love you. I only left you in the fire swamp to test your love for me. Is it as great as mine for you? Can two such loves exist on one planet at one time? Is there that much room, beloved Wesley? The albino bandaged his fingers. Wesley lay still. For the first time, the albino started things. Whispered, you'd better tell them. From Wesley, mm, a shrug. Whispered, they never stop, not once they start. Tell them what they want to know and have done with it. Mm. Whispered, the machine is nearly ready. They are testing it on animals now. Mm. Whispered, it's for your own good I tell you these things. My own good? What good? They're going to kill me anyways. From the albino. Mm. The prince found Buttercup waiting unhappily outside his chamber doors. It's my letter, she began. I cannot make it right. Come in, come in, the prince said gently. Maybe we can help you. She sat down in the same chair as before. All right, I'll close my eyes and listen. Read to me. Wesley, my passion, my sweet, my only, my own. Come back, come back. I shall kill myself otherwise. Yours in torment, Buttercup. She looked at Humperdinck. Well, do you think I'm throwing myself at him? It does seem a bit forward, the prince admitted. It doesn't leave him a great deal of room to maneuver. Will you help me improve it, please? I'll do what I can, sweet lady. But first, it might help if I knew just a bit about him. Is he really so wonderful, this Wesley of yours? Not so much wonderful as perfect, she replied. Kind of flawless, more or less magnificent, without blemish, rather on the ideal side, she looked at the prince. Am I being helpful? I think emotions are clouding your objectivity just a bit. Do you actually think there is nothing the fellow can't do? Buttercup thought for a while. It's not so much that there's nothing he can't do. It's more that he can do it all better than anybody else can do it. The prince chuckled and smiled. In other words, for example, you mean if he wanted to hunt, he could out hunt again, for example, someone such as myself. Oh, I would think if he wanted to, he could quite easily. But he happens not to like hunting, at least to my knowledge. So, uh, though maybe he does, I don't know. I never knew he was so interested in mountain climbing, but he scaled the cliffs of insanity under most adverse conditions, and everyone agrees that that's not the easiest thing in the world to accomplish. Well, why don't we just begin our letter with Divine Wesley, an appeal to his sense of modesty, the prince suggested. Buttercup began to write, stopped. Does divine begin D-E or D-I? D-I, I believe, amazing creature, the prince replied, smiling gently as Buttercup commenced the letter. They composed it in four hours, and many, many times she said, I could never get through this without you. And the prince was always most modest, asking little helpful personal questions about Wesley as often as was possible without drawing attention to it, and in this way, well before dawn, she told him, smiling as she remembered, of Wesley's early fears of spinning ticks. Mm. And that night, in the fifth level cage, the prince asked, as he was always asked, as he was to always ask, Tell me the name of the man in Gilder who hired you to kidnap the princess, and I promise you immediate freedom. And Wesley replied, as he was always to reply, No one. No one. I was alone. 
and the Count, who had spent the day getting the spinners ready, placed them carefully on Wesley's skin. And Wesley closed his eyes and begged and pleaded, and after an hour or so the prince and the count left, the albino remaining behind with the chore of burning the spinners and then pulling them free from Wesley, lest they accidentally poison him. And on the way up the underground stairs to the ground level, the prince said, just for conversation's sake, much better, don't you think? The count, oddly, said nothing, which was vaguely irritating to Humperdinck because, to tell the absolute truth, Torture was never all that high on his scale of passions, and he would just as soon have disposed of Wesley right then. If only Buttercup would admit that he, Humperdinck, was the better man. But she would not. She simply would not. All she ever talked about was Wesley. All she ever asked about was news of Wesley. Days went by, weeks went by, party after party went by, and all Florin was moved by the spectacle of their great hunting prince, at last so clearly and wonderfully in love. But when they were alone, all she ever said was, I wonder where could Wesley be? What could be taking him so long? How could I live until he comes? Maddening. So each night, the Count's discomforts, which made Wesley writhe and twist, were really sort of all right. The Prince would manage an hour or so of spectating before he and the Count would leave. The Count still oddly silent. And down below, tending the wounds, the albino would whisper, tell them, please, they will only add to your suffering. Wesley could barely suppress his smile. He had felt no pain, not once, none. He had closed his eyes and taken his brain away. That was the secret. If you could take your brain away from the present and send it to where it could contemplate skin-like wintry cream, well, let them enjoy themselves. His revenge time would come. Wesley was living now, most of all, for Buttercup. But there was no denying that there was one more thing he wanted to do. Oh, one more thing he wanted, too. His time. Prince Humperdinck simply had no time. There seemed to be not only one decision, there seemed to be not one decision in all of Florin that one way or another didn't eventually come heavily to rest upon his shoulders. Not only was he getting married, his country was having its 500th anniversary. Not only was he noodling around in his mind the best ways to get a war going, he also had constantly, had to constantly have affection shining from his eyes. Every detail had to be met, and met correctly. His father was just no help at all, refusing either to expire or to stop mumbling. You thought his father was dead, but that was in the fake-out. Don't forget, Morgenstern was just edging into the nightmare sequence, so don't be confused. And start making sense. Queen Bella simply hovered around him, translating here and there, and it was with a shock that Prince Humperdinck realized, just twelve days before his wedding day, that he had neglected to set in motion the crucial gilder section of his plan. So he called a yellin to the castle late one night. Not a yellin, just yellin. Yellin was chief of all enforcement in Florin City, a job he had inherited from his father. The albino keeper at the zoo was Yellen's first cousin, and together they formed the only pair of non-nobles the prince would come close to trusting. Your Highness, Yellen said. <clears throat> he was small, but crafty with darting eyes and slippery hands. Prince Humperdinck came out from behind his desk. He moved close to Yellen and looked carefully around before saying softly, I have heard from unimpeachable sources that many men of Gilder have of late begun to infiltrate our thieves' quarter. They are disguised as Florinese, and I am worried. I have heard nothing of such a thing, Yellen said. A prince has spies everywhere. I understand, said Yellen. And you think, since the evidence points that they tried to kidnap your fiancé once, such a thing might happen again? It's a possibility. I'll close off the thieves' quarter then, Yellen said. No one will enter and no one will leave. Not good enough, said the prince. I want the thieves' quarter emptied and every villain jailed until I am safely on my honeymoon. Yellen, that was not a yawn. Yellen did not nod quickly enough. So the prince said, state your problem. 
My men are not always too happy at the thought of entering the thieves' quarter. Many of the thieves resist change. Root them out. Form a brute squad, but get it done. It takes at least a week to get a decent brute squad going, Yellen said. But that is time enough. He bowed and started to leave. And that was when the scream began. Yellen had heard many things in his life. But nothing quite so eerie as this. He was a brave man, but this sound frightened him. It was not human, but he could not guess the throat of the beast it came from. It was actually a wild dog on the first level of the zoo, but no wild dog had ever shrieked like that before. But then, no wild dog had ever been put in the machine. The sound grew in anguish, and it filled the night sky as it spread across the castle grounds, over the walls, even into the great square beyond. It would not stop. It simply hung now below the sky, an audible reminder of the existence of agony. In the great square, half a dozen children screamed back at the night, trying to blot out the sound. Some wept, some only ran for home. Then it began to lessen in volume. Now it was hard to hear in the great square. Now it was gone. Now it was hard to hear on the castle walls. Now it was gone from the castle walls. It shrunk across the grounds towards the first level of the zoo of death where Count Rugen sat fiddling with some knobs. The wild dog died. Count Rugen rose, and it was all he could do to bury his own shriek of triumph. He left the zoo and ran towards Prince Humperdinck's chambers. Yellen was just going when the Count got there. The Prince was seated now behind his desk. When Yellen was gone and they were alone, the Count bowed to his majesty. The machine he said at last, works. Prince Humperdinck took a while before answering. It was a ticklish situation. Granted, he was the boss, the Count merely an underling. Still, no one in all Florin had Rugen's skills. As an inventor, he had obviously, at last, rid the machine of all defects. As an architect, he had been crucial in the safety factors involved that's not a yawn, in the, do, in the zoo of death, and it had undeniably been Rugen who had arranged for the only survivable entrance being the underground fifth level one. He was also supportive to the prince in all endeavors of hunting and battle, and you didn't give a follower like that a quick, get away boy, you bother me, so the prince indeed took a while. Look, Ty, he said finally, I'm just thrilled you smoothed all the bugs out of the machine. I never for a minute doubted you'd get it right eventually. And I'm really anxious, as can be, to see it working. But how can I put this? I can't keep my head above water one minute to the next. It's not just the parties and the goo-gooing and with what's-her-name. I've got to decide how long the 500th anniversary parade is going to be and where does it start and where does it... Um, and when it starts... Which nobleman gets to march in front of which other nobleman so that everyone's still speaking to me at the end of it? Plus, I've got a wife to murder and a country to frame for it. Plus, I've got to get the war going once that's all happened. And all this stuff I've got to do myself. Here's what it all comes down to. I'm just swamped, Ty. So how about if you go to work on Wesley and tell me how it goes? And when I get the time, I'll come and watch. I'm sure it'll be just wonderful. But for now, what I'd like is a little breathing room. No hard feelings? Count Rugen smiled. None. And there weren't any. He always felt better when he could dole out pain alone. You could concentrate much more deeply when you were alone with agony. I knew you'd understand, Ty. There was a knock on the door and Buttercup stuck her head in. Any news? she said. The prince smiled at her and sadly shook his head. Honey, I promise to tell you the second I hear a thing. It's only twelve days, though. Plenty of time, dulcet darling. Now don't worry yourself. I'll leave you, Buttercup said. I was going too, the Count said. May I walk you to your quarters? Buttercup nodded, and down the corridors they walked, wandered till they reached her suite. Good night, Buttercup said quickly. Ever since that day he had first come to her father's farm, she had always been afraid whenever the Count came near. I'm sure he'll come, the Count said. He was privy to all the prince's plans, and Buttercup was well aware of this. I don't know your fellow well, but he impressed me greatly. 
Any man who can find his way through the fire swamp can find his way to Florin Castle before your wedding day. Buttercup nodded.